the live streaming is started. So a warm welcome back after what I believe has been a peaceful, calm and happy day for many of you, those who have sent a little message just now. Uh, just trying to, okay, change my screen. Okay, good. So technology is all working. This is wonderful. So welcome back everybody. And I hope that you are gradually settling into the retreat. So, so far today, there's been a lot. And I thought that Ajahn Brahmali was really on fire with inspiration from the Dhamma today. And uh, I was certainly getting really roused and inspired and you know, connected with the meaning of this path and the meaning of going forth as a, as a monastic as well. Um, and it's a lot, it's a lot to take in, in a sense, especially if you're not used to um, teachings that go straight from the suttas, you know, straight from the early Buddhist texts and kind of, uh, what do you say, pull no punches, is that the right phrase? <laughs> they don't beat around the bush, they go straight to the heart of the matter. And um, I just wanted to sort of suggest or maybe encourage you to receive these in an embodied way as though you're not trying to grasp at the meaning of all the words, you know, and the concepts and the detail, but more that you're getting a felt sense of where it's coming from. Because I really believe, you know, that everything we receive is like a seed that we can't unpack all at once, but it's like it goes deep inside the heart, depending on how ready our heart is to receive it, and it germinates gradually in its own time. And, you know, bears, flowers and fruits, uh, when the conditions ripen, we can't take it all in straight away and we don't have to. So just for your own ease during any of these sessions, please just allow the words to wash over you um, and, and trust that whatever you need to hear, whatever is meaningful for you in your practice will stay. And it'll come up at the most unexpected times when you might just need a little nudge in one direction or another. You might find something pops up and it just comes to life for you. But certainly not everything is going to and it doesn't need to. You know, in the Buddha's day, people could get enlightened after just the simplest and shortest of teachings. So even though this content is quite rich and uh, this evening I'm going to be giving you a little bit more, not too much, but a little bit more content, just some suggestions to rouse and uplift the mind. Even though that's the case, um, just, you know, take it very gently and don't worry about understanding everything or notice if your mind starts to kind of have a discourse with what's being offered and just see if you can come back to an embodied sense. So there are different ways of listening. You know, we can listen with our head or we can listen more internally with our whole body, with our heart, deep listening. So see if you can connect with your body even while I speak and just see where these words land. So this evening I wanted to talk about the quality of sadha or confidence or faith, um, sometimes translated as trust, even belief. And confidence is a very beautiful quality. It's one of the five indriyas, the five spiritual faculties or powers, sometimes translated as the five friends. Um, and sadha is something that helps to impart energy and joy to the practice and to get this sequence of what we call dependent liberation going. So this retreat, the theme is all about causality. It's about the causes of suffering and how suffering arises and leads to suffering even in future births. But it's also about dependent liberation, which starts from that very same suffering, but it heads in a different direction and the link between suffering and that new path, the path of dependent liberation, is this confidence, this faith, trust. I like the word trust as well, because it implies that we can trust in this process, we can trust in ourselves, we can trust that we're going the right way. So we can also trust in the teachings, right? We can trust the ideas of things like karma, the idea, 
that is verifiable, that your actions, the quality of your intention does determine whether you're going to suffer or find happiness in life. Yeah. If you act from a pure mind, then happiness follows you like a shadow that never departs. If you act from a mind of hate, a mind of greed or delusion, then suffering follows, as it says in the Dhammapada, like the wheel of an ox or the wheel of the ox cart follows that ox. It's yoked to that ox. And so really, karma is all about the quality of our intention. And we can have confidence, we can have trust that if we keep on purifying our intention, it's going to lead to ever increase, increasing happiness for ourselves in life. We can have confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, not necessarily as, as beings, although the Buddha was a historical figure. And even the Sangha, it literally refers to enlightened monks and nuns, or people who have at least attained the first um, path, so the, the path of stream winning or stream entry. Um, but even then, it's not really about the individuals because we can never be sure, but it's about the qualities that they embody yeah? and the qualities of the qualities of the Dhamma. The fact that awakening is possible and that these people represent that. But more than that, that it's still attainable, even in this lifetime, even in this era, and it's attainable by us. You know, sometimes you can read verses of things like the Terigata, where you um, read about enlightened nuns. And sometimes, you know, they went through great despair and even came to the point where they put their head in a noose. There was this one um, nun, she said for seven years, I think it was, or maybe even 15 years, she found no peace of mind at all. No peace of mind. Can you imagine? You've gone forth, you've left your family, you've given up your career, your job. You know, maybe you've really um, dropped out of society, so to speak. And, uh, you know, you, you don't get necessarily a lot of thanks for that. You know, it's a very difficult life, especially in ancient India, where people had to wander for miles and miles, you know, barefoot to receive whatever meager offerings they would receive into their arms bowl. And still she had no peace of mind. So she was so desperate, she actually tied this noose to a tree and put her head through the noose. And it was only at that moment, <laughs> which is why it's, you know, a story preserved for so long that apparently she achieved enlightenment, you know, at that moment of total despair. So again, this points to how suffering can sometimes be the cause for this confidence, for this something to suddenly click if it's seen in the right way and if there's that moment of letting go. So I also wanted to talk in these evening sessions. Today it will be more about confidence, but I'm going to draw it out a little bit more in terms of confidence in the triple gem. So in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. And also um, confidence in, in a sense or reflection, recollection on our own goodness, our own purity, our own generosity of heart. And these are called the anusatis, things that can help to rouse this confidence, rouse joy and get us on this path of dependent liberation. You know, the process that leads us from suffering to complete freedom and unshakable peace. And I also wanted to talk about metta and upekka. And it's quite interesting because at first I wasn't sure how these related, but then I found this quote in um, the Majjhima Nikaya and it's actually from the Maha Hatipatopama Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya number 28. And it links all these practices together, which is really interesting. So here it says, when one recollects the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, equanimity supported by the wholesome becomes established in one. So even these reflections on the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha can lead to those wholesome states increasing. States like loving kindness, compassion, generosity, simplicity, contentment, and also to equanimity. So this again indicates how they are really a foundation. Confidence is the first of these five injuries, and it leads to energy, first of all. It leads to energy, and then the third injury is sati, mindfulness, because we need a certain amount of energy on our mind to be able to actually um, sustain our awareness on any particular meditation object or subject or theme. You know, we have to have some energy there. 
we, it doesn't work if our eyes are kind of half shut, you know, our mental eyes, so to speak. We can't really see what's going on. And then from there, samadhi can start to develop. Samadhi is basically the mindfulness that is sustained on an object for prolonged periods of time and starts to sink into, even absorb right into that object and see deeper and deeper into what's happening. And then lastly, the last of these five indriyas is wisdom because wisdom arises when the mind is calm, when the mind is free from the five hindrances. And so confidence is like a foundation for the whole of the path, sila, samadhi, and panya, virtue, meditation, or calm, stillness, and wisdom, which includes equanimity. Yeah? So confidence is such a beautiful quality, and there's many ways to define it. It's never um, about blind belief in Buddhism, but it's always something that's verifiable. And I think this makes it really beautiful. And it has different stages. So in the beginning, you know, when we haven't yet experienced too many of the fruits of the practice, it's a kind of provisional confidence, yeah? It's enough to give us the interest, the encouragement, the motivation to take at least the first step on the path, you know, without any confidence. If your mind is riddled with like skeptical doubt, you're not going to get that energy, that inspiration to even try. Yeah, you're, you're already kind of decided that this is, this is not going to work. And so your mind is closed and you're not able to receive anything new. Ajahn Chah has this lovely phrase, I found it today actually. And he says, whenever we feel that we're definitely right, so much that we refuse to open up to anything or anybody else. Right there, we are wrong. It becomes wrong view. When suffering arises, where does it arise from? The cause is wrong view, the fruit of that being suffering. If it was right view, it wouldn't cause suffering. So this is what happens when we don't have confidence, you know, that perhaps we might not be right. Perhaps the Buddha did know something. Perhaps there's a path that I haven't yet discovered. There's something more to be done. And then we can become open, at least to taking that first step. And over time, of course, that first step turns into the second and the third and maybe many years of practice. And during this time, our confidence, our faith becomes verified. And this is kind of, or let's say inspired, first of all, yeah, it becomes inspired because it's a long way until it's fully verified. But in the middle, it turns into something that's actually called pasada in the Pali. So pasada is very similar to sada, to faith, but it's a kind of inspired confidence that imparts serenity, um, clarity, steadiness, and a sense of calm. It's a very beautiful word. It's like when you feel that you found your path, you found the meaning of life. You know, you feel like, yes, there is a purpose to this suffering. It's not only to suffer more, but suffering can be understood. Ajahn Chah, again, he said there were two kinds of suffering. The suffering that leads to more suffering, which is what we all have, especially before we hear the Buddha's teachings, right? It's just, if you suffer, of course, you're gonna be unhappy. Of course you want to get rid of it. Of course you crave for something else, right? That's just our default response. So that's the suffering that leads to more suffering. But Ajahn Chah said there's also the suffering that leads to the end of suffering. And of course, this is what the Buddha meant by, you know, the Four Noble Truths. He pointed out where and how we suffer in order to stimulate and inspire a wish to find an end to that suffering. And of course, being so compassionate and so wise, he didn't just leave us hanging. He pointed out a path and he pointed that path out very, very clearly. And so as we practice, this pasada starts to grow. One of the nuns in um, Perth is actually called Venerable Pasada. And I find it a very beautiful name, just this inspired, serene faith, confidence that starts to work like a kind of, um, like petrol in your tank. I mean, I don't really like, I usually complain when Ajahn Brahm's always using car similes because I think we're not really like cars, right? <laughs> That's a very male kind of way of looking at the body. But it's like a kind of fuel source that keeps you going even through times of doubt because it's not as though um, doubt is never going to arise again at this point. You know, even on my path, 
even though I've been ordained now for 15 years, I still have a wobble from time to time and think, is this really the path that's going to be the, the best, the most productive, the most beneficial for myself and other people? Am I really progressing on the path? How do I measure that? You know. So sometimes there can still be doubt even at this stage, but it's not a kind of skeptical or cynical doubt that stops us taking a step. It's the kind of doubt that just spurs us on to look a little deeper, to keep going, not to give up. You know, you can say, oh, well, look, don't look like this morning. Do I feel better than I did this morning? But look, you know, two years ago in your life or maybe five years ago in your life before you contacted the Dhamma and see if there has been even any slight change and that's something to really celebrate because without a path, you know, how do we know where we'd be right now? You know, I think that most of the time without a path, we just become more and more disillusioned because we're searching in the wrong place for happiness, you know, and the kind of sparkle and the glow, the energy we had when we were young starts to fade away. You know, I know for myself, I'm 46, 45 don't add a year on. I'm 45 for another few days. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it's not the same. I don't have the same amount of energy. I don't have the same amount of kind of um, a sense of anything is possible and I could change direction at any time. You know, I kind of feel like, no, I need to start getting serious about things and, and put my energy into something for the long term now. You know, and I'm aware that by the time I reach 50 or so, that energy is going to drop again. So I've been told, of course, it's different for different people. But, you know, without a path, it can be very daunting about what's to come next. And so the third level of this sadha is what I would call verified confidence, verified trust. And we get verified along the way, right? We know at least at this stage that if I perform wholesome actions, then I'm likely to benefit myself and others. And as a result, I'm going to experience happiness or at least there won't be any regret or remorse. Yeah. Have you ever noticed that that's a kind of happiness? You can go to sleep in the night with, without a terrible conscience. You know, the Buddha says, if you have a heart of loving kindness, then you go to sleep easily. You don't have bad dreams and you wake up fairly happy and energized. Of course, that depends on what you've been doing also in the day. Sometimes I wake up really groggy, but most of the time I don't have bad dreams and I don't torment myself over my conduct because my conduct's pretty good. You know, you can always find fault with a few things here and there that are not 100%, but think about all the things that are all the things that you can rejoice in. This should give you trust. This should give you confidence. And that confidence becomes fully verified, unwavering, unshakable, when we become stream winners. Yeah, it's the first stage of um, enlightenment on this path. And it's also one of the defining features of a stream winner, that they have this unshakable trust, this unshakable confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha, so much so that they can never actually um, take up any other religion because nothing else really makes sense. They know that this path leads to the end of suffering and they've done the work. They've seen that you know, greed, hatred, and delusion have been kind of mortally wounded in, in a sense, not completely eradicated at this stage, but they now have right view. And that right view in itself, I think, um, is a cause for confidence. I was reflecting on this earlier and the Buddha's always um, in the causal sequence, suffering is the cause for confidence to arise. And I can really understand that. It actually speaks straight to my experience. Um, because for me, you know, it was, it was because I was sort of suffering and wondering, why am I here? What's the meaning of life? That those teachings, when I heard them, went straight to my heart. You know, especially teachings on suffering and the fact that there is a way out. It was like, this is speaking to the heart of the problem and I want to follow the path. You know, it was such a great relief for me. But I was also thinking this only really happens, it only really works if there's something in between uh, suffering and confidence. And that something in between, again, is I think understanding a wise way to relate to suffering. So the suffering that leads to the end of suffering rather than suffering that just leads round and round in circles, taking you deeper and deeper down. And of course, that can only happen if you've heard the teachings and if you have a modicum of right view. So you start understanding, yeah, not only I suffer, but all beings suffer. All beings desire their happiness and recoil from pain. 
And then the path takes on a different quality. It's not just about, am I doing okay? Are you doing okay? Oh, you don't suffer. I don't suffer. What's the point of trying? Or I suffer, but, you know, I'll just look after myself. No, we all suffer. And the path becomes motivated by compassion. So this right view is also one of the prerequisites, I think, for the confidence that develops. And as usual, there's lots I want to say, and I always forget that I only gave myself uh, 15 minutes for these evening talks. But there's just one more element that I want to um, mention about Sada, and that is that it has both an intellectual or rational element so we can understand the teachings conceptually and we can analyze them, we can try and figure out, do they make sense? And this is really encouraged in Buddhism. You know, The Buddha actually said, one that comes, let me see if I've got the quote. Yeah, so even though we have our critical faculties, he still doesn't encourage us to land at a conclusion straight away. He actually says that we can have a kind of provisional hypothesis, if, if you like, but that we should continue to explore and investigate. So it's really encouraging that critical thinking, that critical faculty that keeps on checking, is this actually leading in the direction of peace, in the direction of um, happiness or not? So he says, this is how, yeah. So one may think my faith is thus, but a wise person who preserves truth does not come to a definite conclusion that only this is true and everything else is wrong when as yet there is no discovery of truth. So again, it's that openness of mind, you know, being open to the possibility of future lives, past lives. So many times, especially in secular Buddhism, so-called secular Buddhism, because I'm not sure it's really Buddhism, <laughs> but people can use that word if they want to. Um, you know, so many times they say, oh, we, we don't believe in, in rebirth. That's just a belief. But believing that there's no rebirth is also a belief. And it can also become very dogmatic, very rigid, to the extent that it precludes you digging that bit deeper in order to find out. And so the Buddha's always saying, don't make up your mind until all the data is in, so to speak. Like a good scientist, right? They'll do their experiment, but they won't come to a conclusion until they have the results. And getting all the data in means getting into very, very deep samadhi time and time again, time and time again, and being able to penetrate deeper and deeper into the nature of things. Yeah. This is how we get data that's unbiased, that's not distorted by the five hindrances. So we actually have a chance to see things as they truly are. And it doesn't happen the first time. You know, It might happen only many, many times that you're getting closer and closer to that truth. So that's the rational um, side of the sadha, but there's also a beautiful emotional element, which I feel really gives like some moisture, some juice to the practice. It keeps the practice from becoming dry. And a nice simile is like, you're trying to make a clay pot. You know, if you imagine, I don't know, I used to do an art foundation course many, many years ago as a rebellious teenager who didn't want to do her A-levels. So I went into art college instead. And we made these pots out of clay and you had to you know, turn it on the wheel. I can't remember how it really worked. But you needed a certain amount of moisture in order to form that pot into the shape you wanted to form it into. If you didn't have enough moisture, it was just too brittle. It was too dry and powdery. And it's kind of the same thing with sadha. You need a little bit of moisture in there. And apparently in the Germanic language, um, the word confidence or faith also has an element of uh, belief. And the way they define belief is actually, is it belief? Yeah, to believe in something is like to devote yourself to something, to give yourself wholeheartedly like to the task at hand, to give all your love, all your kindness, all your time, all your energy to whatever it is that you're attending to. And I find this very beautiful, you know, as an aspect of faith or an aspect of confidence or trust, that we can give ourselves 100% to whatever we're doing with this confidence that if we're coming from the right place, it's bound to lead to good results, not only for ourselves, but for others as well. And they are really the yardsticks to know whether this really is the Dhamma. 
So I want to leave it there because these sessions are supposed to be about meditation as well and also to give you some time for questions and answers. Um, but hopefully that just can give you a few ideas for confidence and how it can help you on the path. And as I say, we'll go into more detail in other sessions. We'll do some reflections on the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. Um, but from the questions today, I was really in two minds as to whether to continue with those themes or whether to talk about metta, first of all. And I was like, do I talk about sada today or metta? But I decided to talk about sada today because I want to, I think it's really helpful to learn to meet suffering first before we try to apply the balm of metta meditation. And I thought that that ties into the theme of sadha, you know, just trusting that this suffering that we experience, if it is wisely related to, it can be, um, basically it is the way through that suffering to something beyond. And so I wanted to, um, to practice with you today, just the method of kindful awareness, how to be kindful with our body and mind, and then possibly give you some meta instructions tomorrow. So. You're welcome to feedback if that sounds good later on. Good, so please getting yourself comfortable once again. And now it's towards the end of the day, you might find that your knees are a bit sore, you might prefer to have a chair, stretch your legs out in front of you, whatever feels kind to your body. Make sure you're warm enough. You may want to even dim your lights. <laughs> And if you're comfortable when you're ready, hmm. gently closing your eyes. I see some of you have created more ambiance now. <laughs> that can also help to just nudge the mind into quietness. And having just spoken for a while, I immediately notice the beauty of silence. So it's resonating all around me. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to check in more deeply with myself. How am I doing? How's my body doing? Is it sitting in the most comfortable posture that it could be sitting in? As soon as I ask that question, I notice I can adjust my ankles, my feet, Give them a little bit more space so nothing's pressing, the weight is even, my toes have room to wiggle. You might want to check if you're sitting on a chair whether the weight is falling through your knees into your ankles or whether there's pressure on the knees. If so, you might want to just move your feet an inch or two forward. So your heels are slightly forward from your knees. The weight can flow down right into the ground.
Sometimes on a chair, I notice that I'm holding my legs together a little bit more than is necessary. I can just allow the thighs to flop outward. Checking your hips, are they even? Are they comfortable being even? Is one slightly forward? Is there more weight on the left buttock or the right? Is that comfortable or can you make any slight adjustment so that you can stay at ease for longer? Checking your belly area, is it contracted? Sometimes if we're hunched, sort of bent a little bit in the belly, you might find that straightening up just gives your intestines, your tummy, a bit more space. And softening the belly. Noticing the back, finding the most comfortable position for your back. Perhaps gently lengthening through the spine by just tilting the head slightly forward. Perhaps imagining the top of the head as though there were like a string attached from the center of your skull to the ceiling. Just encouraging it to find that space above. And letting your shoulders perhaps gently roll back and drop down. Seeing if you need to adjust your hands accordingly. And finding the optimum position for your hands, your fingers to be free. And if you wish to follow the suggestions, then we can start by just bringing our awareness to the top of the head. Establishing mindfulness of any sensations anywhere on the head. And infusing that awareness, that mindfulness with a sense of kindness, friendliness, curiosity, just open to receive. I like to use Ajahn Brahm's simile for kindness.
kindfulness, mindfulness plus kindness. So in this simile, mindfulness is like the light of the sun. And kindness is like the warmth of the sun. They go together. So that wherever mindfulness falls, it sees what's happening. But the warmth, also the kindness, cares. You can even imagine that you're basking in the warm sunshine, suffusing the entire head <clears throat> with the golden light of kindfulness. Bringing you more and more deeply into the present moment and relaxing with this present moment. Trust in kindfulness to reveal the nature of reality to you. Allowing any tension in the forehead, the brow, the eyes to just melt away. The cheeks, the jaw to slacken. as this kindfulness spreads through the neck, around the throat, across the shoulders, like the sun on a warm spring day. Soothing any tension, any tightness, without any effort on your part. Just content to stay with whatever arises. Learning to relate wisely with kindness, gentleness, and letting go. The three right intentions, wise motivations. A good karma attitude to whatever arises in your body and also in your mind. Exploring the whole arm. The elbow. Lower arm, wrist. Palms. The back of the hand, the fingers, the fingertips. Without any force, just gently resting. Your awareness. Receiving any sensation anywhere on the whole of your arm, all the way to your fingertips. And 
And this golden sunlight spreads through your whole body, from your collarbone to your chest, ribs, diaphragm, belly, all around the trunk, down the back. even penetrating to the organs deep inside. Just receiving any sensation, not needing to know why it arose, what it means. Just noticing how you're relating to whatever arises. Whether there's any clinging, any pushing away, or whether this kindfulness can help you make peace, befriend, Relax with even the most painful sensation you may encounter on the way. If you do encounter any chronic pain anywhere in the body, you might wish to experiment with how close your attention remains. Maybe just hovering around that area. Perhaps taking in some of the area that is not in pain. Or if your mind feels very resourced, very kind, you may be able to get closer. And just see what's going on. Is it really as solid as it may seem? What happens when you let go of wanting it to change? So allow your kindfulness to keep spreading naturally into the hips, the buttocks, to the thighs, Noticing, receiving sensations in the knees, behind the knees. And just relaxing with those sensations. Giving them all your care and attention. 
as though they were the only thing in the world for you right now. Exploring the shins, the calves, the ankles, the feet. Even noticing toes, any sensations in the toes all the way to the tips. Relaxing with whatever you experience. This is a kind of letting go. Noticing just how simple this moment can be. And if you wish, you may like to sense the whole body. Suffused with this kindfulness. Just take a moment to linger with any area that needs a little bit more kind attention. Or noticing any places that you're still holding. Encouraging them to just let go. As though you were soaking in a warm bathtub completely suspended, supported by the water so that all the muscles can fully relax. Just noticing the delight of a relaxed body and how that delight can relax the mind. Causing mindfulness to grow perhaps to pick up increasingly subtle objects like the breath. As your mind becomes stiller, 
you might find the breath naturally arises. If so, see what kind of attention is needed to just meet the breath. So that you give it the space it needs without trying to capture or hold on to the breath. But enough closeness so that it doesn't just fly away. And if the breath doesn't arise for you, that's fine too. Just stay close to this present moment with a beautiful, non-demanding, kind and gentle attitude. Making peace with whatever arises Knowing peace is the path as well as the goal. So we're coming to the end of this meditation. Although you don't have to open your eyes. Feel free to continue just enjoying the process of allowing burdens to drop away. If you do wish to 
come out of meditation and engage with the question and answer. Before doing that, just check once again how your body feels. Has the energetic tone of your experience changed since we began the meditation? How does the relaxed body feel? And does that affect the mind? Does it help to lead the mind to peace? seems so quiet I'm going to skip the little gong because it doesn't have such a nice tone as Ajahn Brahmani's bell. Instead I'll just make a virtual gong sound. <laughs> to bring you out of your meditation. Okay, and if you don't have questions, you can continue to meditate. <laughs> so as we did this morning or this afternoon with Ajahn Pramani, um, I would like to suggest that you could send any questions, comments, feedback to Derek, Q&A Derek. Um, the way to do that is to press on the chat box and then you press on the little name in the chat box and you'll find Derek in there, Q&A Derek. And then uh, I shall be receiving your questions. So someone says this was very relaxing meditation. It felt almost like a dream. The only question I have is how to relax the mouth tongue position, the mouth or position the tongue in the best way, please. How do I do that? It's very instinctive, I suppose, and uh, maybe a bit of an experiment each time. What I generally find is that uh, my jaw can be looser <laughs> than it actually is, you know. I think I'm probably conditioned to smile quite a lot. So even when I meditate, <laughs> I sometimes got this smile on my face and I realize actually, I can just let it hang. <laughs> so I sometimes just part my jaw a little bit and sort of intentionally allow it to just drop. But I find if I pay too much attention to the position of my tongue and mouth and worry about that, then it just becomes a bit of a disturbance. So rather than think about my tongue and my mouth, I more get in touch with the general sensations in the face and just notice whether there's any holding, tightness, tension, and just relax around that. Yeah, the other common experience meditators have is when they suddenly told to notice their saliva. As soon as I say the word saliva, you'll be noticing water, certain taste maybe, and uh, <laughs> you might, you know, figure out, oh, there's quite a bit there, or oh, there's not much, and suddenly you become very obsessed with the saliva. This this happens a lot in extremely silent retreats, actually, um, you know, which are so silent, you can hear anybody just swallow. And sometimes you find that when one person swallows, everybody else feels like they need to swallow. And I've been on retreats where I've been like, gosh, I swallowed about 10 minutes ago, it's too soon to swallow again. 
<laughs> you know, and you sort of become very conscious of it. And the best way is actually just to not to give it too much attention. Yeah. So it's an experiment, you know, what works for one person doesn't work for someone else and what works for you this time won't work next time. So it doesn't really matter. What's important is you make peace with whatever you experience. And that's what uh, Ajahn Brahm sometimes calls good meditation karma. Making good meditation karma is a great um, way to see it. You know, whatever arises, you have a, a choice. If you know you have a choice, then you, you're aware enough to make a choice between reacting, responding with craving and aversion or making peace, being kind, being gentle to whatever arises in the mind. And if that's what you do, even if that's the way you incline, no matter how far you incline that way, you can be sure that you're making good karma because the motivation of your mind is coming from the right place. What would you recommend for someone who doubts a lot all the time? Well, firstly, I would say, try not to label yourself as someone who doubts a lot all the time, <laughs> but rather notice that, oh, from time to time, doubt arises, doubt has arisen. Because sometimes we can really make an identity out of basically anything. And when you say all the time, I can't believe it is all the time because to come on that re this retreat, you had a moment of clarity, unless you now really doubt your decision, <laughs> which may be the case. Um, there is some sort of, you know, stable intention that's brought you here that kind of sustains your practice and that keeps you showing up, you know. So certainly you're on a particular path, you're on a particular journey and that doubt has not derailed you yet. So the way to overcome doubt, of course, is to, to develop our practice. Like the classic antidote is to um, study, to read, to learn about the Dhamma. And of course, that includes practice, investigating the Dhamma, you know, trying to um, understand what it is that you have doubts about. And there's a difference, as I said, between a kind of crippling doubt, which won't even allow you to look, and a doubt that's more inquisitive. And the inquisitive kind of curious doubt is not a bad thing. There's another kind of doubt that the Buddha likens in the classic example of the five hindrances. He says, doubt is like crossing a desert, like being lost in a desert. You know, so you're in this very hot, dry place and you know maybe you need to find water and you can't find that water and you have no idea which way to go. I can't resist a little story that Ajahn Brown sometimes tells. I find it quite funny. Uh, there's this person who's lost in the desert and uh, he's been lost for, you know, one or two days and is really thirsty and really quite concerned that, you know, he won't be able to last much longer. And then all of a sudden he can't believe it in the, in the um, far distance on the horizon. He wonders, is it a mirage? Because he sees this dog sleigh coming. And then he notices this Eskimo with all these huskies. And he's like, oh my goodness, I'm saved. So he runs up to this, uh, eventually, well, not really runs, he sort of staggers along. Oh my goodness, you've saved my life. You know, I'm so glad to have found you. And the Eskimo looks at him and says, what? And you think you're lost. <laughs> right, because it's a desert. <laughs> So what's the Eskimo doing in a desert? So, oh dear, sometimes we can be lost and everyone else around us is lost as well. So that doesn't really help at all. But really it's the Buddha's teachings that overcome that doubt because the Buddha's teachings also act as a map. They act as a kind of lay of the land. So we actually learn to sort of see things in perspective. And I think that's what the Four Noble Truths do for me. You know, it's this map that's very clearly laid out like a prescription, right? Here's the disease, suffering. Here's the cause of the disease, you know, craving is the cause for suffering in a nutshell, right? There is an end to that disease. That's the prognosis, right? The end. In other words, there's an eradication. There's a way to eradicate that suffering by letting go. And then there is a path to help us do that, which is the Eightfold Path. And it's this that can overcome the doubts. So it's really normal to have doubts. And as I say, until you're a stream winner, you know, you will have doubt arising, but it's more the way we, what we do with those doubts, how we learn to overcome them 
And uh, I think not buying into them is also really important. You know, Just simple instructions like making peace or being kind to whatever arises can help overcome doubt because you focus less on the content of your experience and trying to understand what's happening and why and more focused on what you can do about it, which is to make good karma in this present moment. You know, and, and it's quite easy to develop confidence in that good karma, in those good intentions, because you can see that every time you make peace, even slightly, something shifts, you know, you, a, a whole um, heap of suffering or even just a little bit of suffering is let go of. And so this helps you to overcome that doubt. So don't worry about that. And I will be giving, like I say, more talks on um, the triple gem. So reflections on the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, just bringing to mind their qualities. And um, you'll probably find as we do that, that um, you can start to recognize some of those qualities in you even now, even now. Otherwise you wouldn't be attracted to this path. If you couldn't see kindness, if you couldn't see any generosity or goodness in your heart, then you wouldn't have started this path. Okay, so someone's asking, is it possible to have unshakable confidence without having stream entry by having the perception of impermanence? It depends what that unshakable confidence is in. I think certainly there can be a, a kind of very strong confidence having seen impermanence or, you know, being in contact with the arising and vanishing of, of the candors, you know, consistently. Um, and I have had times in my life where I've, you know, had no doubt basically that I'm on the path and that this path is leading in one particular direction and that confidence has been really, really strong. And then there've been other times when I have had a bit of doubt, not so much about the path, not so much about the teachings, but about my own ability to put them into practice and to um, really move in the, not in the direction, but, you know, go as far as I want to go in this life. And again, I was thinking earlier that another um, obstacle, I guess, to confidence is that sometimes our own time scale causes us to doubt, right? Because it might be that we're progressing, but because we're not progressing as fast as we think we should be, we start to doubt ourselves. And actually what's wrong there is not the way we're practicing, but just our own expectations, our own kind of self-imposed ideas about how long this path should be. And we really have no idea. I mean, one teaching that is kind of both frightening and also encouraging all at once is um, this idea that, you know, um, we've been practicing maybe for eons and we have no idea how many lifetimes we've been practicing for. You know, sometimes people say to me, they used to say to me when I was really you know, 20 or so, and I was already really um, devoted to the path, they'd be like, I'm so envious of you. I'm 50 and I only just found the Dhamma. And they'd be like, yeah, but you don't know um, how many lifetimes you've been practicing already. You have no idea. You can't measure the qualities that you're developing or I'm developing. It might be different things for different people in different ways. You know, and so really it's not the point. The main point is just to keep on taking those steps. But I do think that you can have very strong confidence without stream entry. But um, one of the things when talking to a, a person who I um, have very deep confidence in as having at least stream entry um, is the joy and the inspiration with which they talk about the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. And I mean, I've been talking to certain people, I can't say too much, right? But it's my perception of these people. I'm not making claims about anybody and they would never make claims about themselves. But um, there's been times when that person's had tears in their eyes, I've had tears in my eyes and I've just been full of bliss for like days when they talk about their unshakable faith. That is really a power. That's why we call it a bala and indriya at that stage. So at the stage of stream entry for an area, you know, the, the confidence in the Buddha and Dhamma and Sangha is completely unshakable because they have experienced what the Buddha experienced, right? So that's the difference. There's a massive difference. But yes, we can still have very, very strong confidence that's an enormous um, force for us on the path um, through having uh, whatever depth of understanding we have already about impermanence about non-self and about suffering certainly 
So it's a wonderful thing. Okay. I find that involvement with the outside world tends to lead to ill will to the world. I know I'm supposed to counter this with metta and compassion, but actually I find this quite difficult. It's easier to withdraw, but this is just avoiding the issue. Any recommendations? Yeah, so I guess my recommendation at first, if at all possible, and it isn't always possible, is to see how far you can be involved without it leading to ill will, to see if you can be involved to the extent where you notice fairly early on whether it's leading to ill will and why. How is it that you're attending to what's happening in the world? You know, are you reading too much bad news? Are you kind of doom scrolling, as they call it nowadays? You know, um, how are you engaging with that world? Are you meeting the right people? Are you meeting people who tend to uplift you, who, you know, have qualities that can inspire you? Or are you hanging around with people who tend to drag you down? You know, what kind of contact are you having? How much of it? And what are you doing with that input? So these are all questions to ask yourself. And um, I think, you know, wise friendship is really important. Somebody to lend a different perspective and to sort of say, like, for example, recently, I feel I was getting, I have been getting in the last few months quite, um, what to say, affected by the situation in Myanmar. And I would feel that something was kind of strange if I wouldn't be affected by that because I've lived in that country for more than four years and basically learned my Dhamma through the traditions in Myanmar, which I'm eternally grateful for beyond belief. Um, I just can't imagine where I'd be in my life today without this path. You know, it's unthinkable to me how meaningless my life would have felt. You know, no matter how many comforts or no matter how many things were going well in the outside at a mundane level, I cannot imagine my life without the Dhamma, you know, and that is thanks to the Burmese people who preserve not only the um, texts, but also the teachings and the practices through so many different lineages and also gave me my holy life, you know. So if I weren't affected by that, I would think that something was wrong. And yet at the same time, um, sometimes just talking to Ajahn Brahm, you know, about this can help me to just take one little step back and realize that this is the nature of samsara. And for me, it doesn't do that in a way that disconnects me or that makes me turn away or leads to any kind of callousness or coldness, but just in a way that actually allows a sense of equanimity to, to coexist with holding that suffering. So that I'm not putting the suffering down, it's not going away, but there's also a sense of, yeah, life really is full of suffering, if not for me right now, for many, you know, and some kinds of unspeakable suffering that we can't even imagine how we would be in that situation ourselves, you know. Um, but alongside that, there's this sense that, yeah, this is the nature of life, of existence, and I have a path, you know. Either I can get bogged down by that and basically render myself incapable of helping anyone else, or I can try to practice open to the suffering to some degree so that compassion arises and then also, you know, learn to care for myself so that I don't burn out and that I can still respond in a appropriate way. So, of course, it's easier to completely withdraw, but that's not really developing the skills you need in order to learn how to handle these things. But sometimes you can also turn off the devices. And I say that for myself as well, you know. <laughs> I hope that helps a little bit. Okay, lots of questions coming. It seems to me that feeling tense from time to time is a habit which comes up in daily life as well as during meditation. And there's the chance to learn to relate to it in a gentle, kind way, and also to investigate and observe it. So is it not good at all to feel tense from time to time during meditation? No, nothing is bad to feel in meditation. There's no bad or good. It's all about how we relate to it, basically. You know, this is why the Buddha's teaching is so radical and revolutionary and completely transformative, because we're not saying it's anything to do with, um, you know, our inner experience per se that's the issue. It's our way of relating to suffering that either leads us to further suffering, you know, ten more tension about being tense, like, ah, I've got this tension, I shouldn't be tense. It's like, <laughs> you become really overwrought. 
Um, or you feel that tension and you just, yeah, like you say, relate to it gently and observe it. And it's the gentle way of handling it that allows you to observe it. You know? Because when the mind is soft, when the mind is receptive, when it's not judging that tension, then you can actually stay with it. You know, when we judge, when we react, we're kind of propelled away. It's like the mind is too hard to get close. So absolutely, you're, you're doing the right thing. It's absolutely fine um, to feel tense. It's just that in these meditations, I just try to mention the word relaxing because most of us might be tense without even knowing it. And sometimes it's just as easy as relating to it with a bit of kindness and then it drops. And it's also to notice the relationship between kindness and relaxation. That when we're kind with things, kind means we're friendly with them. We don't try and push them away. Right? If you had a friend and you were, you said you were being kind to them, but you actually were trying to kind of get rid of them, that wouldn't be real kindness at all. So when that happens, um, you know, it just builds suffering. So the reason I mention um, relaxing is just to notice the relationship between that kindness and the way it tends to affect the body and mind. Um, okay, is it usual to have some muscle twitching and itching sessions during meditation? Um, so it's usual to have any sensation in the entire universe is my first answer to that. There are so many sensations that can arise when we start contacting the world of Vedana. It's um, really curious. But yeah, itching and twitching is very common. Mm. It's interesting in places like Burma because you get bitten quite a bit by mosquitoes and Ajahn Brahm always tells his tough forest monk stories. Nuns don't tend to do that. I'm not sure why, even though we have plenty. <laughs> but we did used to sit in a Dharma hall without any windows or doors because I was in that monastery before it was even ready. In fact, I went to my teacher's monastery before he went there. <laughs> That's how eager I was to go. Um, he said, just wait two weeks, there's nobody there yet. I said, no, no, I can't wait because I've only got, I had a three month holiday at the time between my uh, third and, no, second and third year of my degree. And so I went there to ordain for three months during that period of time. And I was like, I didn't want to miss two weeks. So <laughs> I kind of pushed him to ordain me immediately. And then we went to this monastery, just me and one other English nun, um, even without the teacher. And the villagers came every day. They walked two miles with food that they'd made at the village. Really good food, probably better than they ate themselves. And then they'd walk all the way back to pick it up again every day. <laughs> um, yes, and so there weren't any doors or windows in that, in that meditation hall. So the mosquitoes would just come in and we had no repellent or anything like that. And uh, it's interesting to notice that, you know, you get bitten a few times and then your body, because it's expecting to be bitten maybe, it produces the same kind of experience all over the body. So the whole body feels like ee, itching all over. And it's really interesting practice. Sometimes we're almost creating it with an expectation in our mind. But it, it's very fascinating to see how, you know, the mind and the body are so related. Yeah, so you're saying you have uh, sensations everywhere. Great. Pain somewhere, lots of itching the nose, temperature of the body increases. Sometimes I try to sweat. It's difficult to be still with all of this. What do I do in order to get quiet? Hmm, that sort of jumps from two different subjects. So I'm not sure because if you're wanting to get quiet when things are the way you describe them, that's a kind of wanting things to be different from the way they are. So I would probably not ask that question at this point. The fact that everything is starting to become pronounced in terms of sensations just shows that your mindfulness is increasing. And this is actually the first step to wake up the mind and prepare it for stillness. So it's actually not a bad thing. You know, you're developing mindfulness, first of all. And then after a while, you'll probably find that those um, reactions start to fade a little bit as your mind and the mindfulness increases you will find that you're getting quieter inside and over time these things will start to quieten down as well so again the body and mind are so related but um, just let it happen you know this is what the body needs to do it could be due to temp um, tension in the body it could be due to all kinds of past causes you know 
sometimes it can also be healing the body, healing certain um, diseases that you may have or maybe accidents that you've had. It could be anything. Um, so really try not to worry about that. Just see if you can relax with it. You know, see if you can relax in the company of, you know, the increased heat and the itching, etc. And if it's getting too intense, it may be that you're kind of staring at those sensations a bit too much, then you can maybe just bring out your awareness to more of a peripheral awareness of the body as a whole. And see if you can maybe just rest with that for a while, if it's getting very intense and if your mind's getting agitated. So just see if you can take care of your mind, staying, you know, um, gentle with whatever you experience, but without trying to push it away. And that gentleness of mind will slowly anyway influence the sensations and they'll start to quieten down. So just let it happen. It's a process. And it's uh, the Buddha said, you know, if Vedana was ours, we could say, may it be this way, may it not be this way. But because it's not ours, we can't do that. We can't have of it. May you be this way, may you not be this way. You know? So this is all great training because these things that you're explaining, you're probably classifying as unpleasant experiences. But, you know, this is an area whereby you can develop a lot more equanimity. You can actually use these sensations to start chipping away, undermining um, ill will. This is the real practice, because it's all very well to say, don't react with anger, don't respond with anger, but how, right? That can be just an intellectual thing. But most of the time when we respond with anger, what we're really doing is responding to an unpleasant sensation within our body within our mind, the two are connected. You know, you feel, ooh, in your stomach, you feel kind of tightness or heat. You react with anger towards someone else. So here you're getting to see that heat in, um, in a situation where mindfulness is arising and where you can develop equanimity instead. So it's great to practice. Okay, I have read that sadha in itself can lead to awakening if it's strong enough to be expressed as those who become awakened through sadha. To what extent is this true and possible? So, um, so yes, Derek, please send all the questions. <laughs> um, so what you're talking about here is a sadha nusari and there's also um, a Dhammanusari. So these are the two types of beings who are on the path to stream winning. And the thing is that these two qualities are not exclusive. So um, basically the person who becomes awakened to Sadha just has that quality of devotion, of love, maybe reverence towards the Buddha Dhamma Sangha um, or strong confidence in the path, strong confidence in the practice. Um, and that is their particular quality. They have a lot of that. And it's a very beautiful thing that really shines through for them. But they also have wisdom. They have to have wisdom in order to break through to stream entry. So they will still have to have the insight into the Four Noble Truths. But that sadha will be a very empowering quality that enables them to approach that. Um, maybe they don't have so much of the investigative or analytical um, mind. You know, we can see this in the world. Some people are a lot more inquisitive, investigative, analytical. Others are more kind of trusting and they have this heart of devotion. You know, that if the teacher says, sit down and watch your breath, they just sit down and watch the breath without really asking, how am I supposed to watch my breath? How many breaths? I watch this breath, am I watching the breath or am I watching the sensations? What's the difference? <laughs> you know, what about meta practice or vipassana practice? This is more the kind of analytical type of person, which is me actually, but I also have a lot of sadha. And so sometimes I also don't know which one would I be, but I think the answer is usually that, um, actually I've heard Ajahn Brahm say this, usually we have both, but most of us have a lot more um, investigative quality than we do sadha. Most of us are actually lacking in the confidence, inspiration, faith. So that's in a way why I wanted to talk about it in these evenings, because I think that is giving you the juice, the joy, the energy, the zest for your practice. Yeah, it's something that moistens the heart, moistens, moistens the heart. And like I say, it's something I've spoken about with my teacher. And I mean, it's just really in my February retreat, we spoke about it almost every day, like 
He was telling me about his practice in ways that I didn't expect and, and the joy and the sadha. And it was just incredibly inspiring. It just propelled me in my practice so much more than, you know, asking Dhamma questions about this or that concept. It was just something very visceral and uh, really inspiringly beautiful. So yeah, sadha can be a really great, a great quality that we can all, I think, um, do well to, to encourage in our hearts. And also while we're on that subject, we are going to finish up pretty soon. Um, some people say, and I think it's commentarial, that we have to balance wisdom and sadha. We have to balance faith with uh, wisdom. But my understanding is that actually you can't really have too much of either, because if sadha is true sadha, it's not blind belief, it's not blind faith, it's actually, it's a force, it's a bala, it's a strength. So the stronger the sadha, the stronger the sila, samadhi and panya that you build on top of it. So we can have as much as we want, these are beautiful qualities, but we shouldn't allow it to slip into blindness you know or kind of not never question the teacher just because they are senior to us this would not be what I would describe as faith this would be um gullibility perhaps um denial even of maybe some misconduct that we might see so that kind of um thing is definitely not a, a quality not a bala not an indria on the path okay so the questions that have come in are from people who I already answered one question. So because we're, uh, uh, yeah, and also they're a little bit big questions. So I'm going to leave them because all of us have had quite a long day and we do encourage you to send one question in. But please, if it's something important that I haven't been able to get to, you're always welcome to ask it again the next day. What you'll probably find is something else will come up or you might get your question answered through your own practice. So sometimes that's the best. And sometimes, you know, the answers that myself or Ajahn Bramali might give might partially resonate, but might lead you to a different view on that same question. So the best way, actually, to finish up, it'd be nice to say that the Buddha said the best way to revere him, the best way to show your respect, your faith, is to practice the Dhamma. That's the best way to venerate, revere, and respect the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha is to practice. So, so well done. And uh, really lovely to practice with all of you today. I thought it was a fantastic uh, day. I even managed to absorb some of the teachings this morning, thanks to my team. I didn't have to be uh, managing every little detail, so I could actually sit back and uh, and connect to the power of those teachings, which was really fantastic. So I hope that, um, yeah, that it's been beneficial for you so far and that you just go with this gently, you know. It's uh, an eight day retreat and it's online. So there may be distractions in your home. It may be quite unfamiliar to you to be in a place where there's no outside structure supporting you. So, um, you know, go gently so that it's sustainable, because sometimes if we go at it too rigidly or um, with too much force in the beginning, it's very easy to get sort of off course, you know, to think, ah, I can't do this. I might as well just, you know, look at my emails or watch something on the TV. So see if you can just take this period of time to really let these things sink in, to give yourself a break, to have a kind of a retreat, retreat yourself. And uh, yeah, as Ajahn Brahm calls it, it's club med, right? club meditation. So take a relaxed approach. <laughs> okay, so I think early night for me and maybe for some of you. And before you sleep, if you remember, see if you can practice metta meditation for a few minutes. And if that sounds like a good topic, uh, is that a good topic for tomorrow? Yeah? Okay, because I was going to do Buddha Sati, but I think... It's better to have some meta talk from the beginning so that that's another tool you can use throughout this retreat. So we'll do some more meta practice tomorrow. But for now, you know, just use some simple phrases when you're going to sleep. May I be happy. May I be well. May I be free from suffering. May I be peaceful. Whatever it is that you want to wish for yourself and do it with your whole heart. And then you might even think about all beings. May all beings be happy. 
May all beings be well. May all beings be safe and be at peace. So it's a really beautiful way to go to sleep. And it means you don't waste even a moment. Okay. So good night. We're not going to unmute you as we do in my talks, I'm afraid, but we'll because it's a silent retreat. But we will do at the end. <laughs>